I want to continue to talk about thinking like a trader and not to get all altruistic on you or anything, but I was thinking right before I went live here that if I could teach you how to think, then someday when I'm no longer around, at least you'll be able to become successful as a trader and I can leave a bit of a legacy. And I really think, as you'll see in just a few minutes, that you're attitude is far more important than your aptitude. Now let's continue our discussion on thinking like a trader. I don't get out a whole lot. In fact, I don't think I've left the house yet this week. Oh, take that back. I did leave the house last night. Forgot about that. But usually sometimes I go a week or so without leaving the house. When quarantine hit, I'm like, oh, okay. It's going to be like a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a Thursday for me. But anyway, long story endless, when I do leave the house, I tend to pick the brain of the man on the street or listen to the man on the street because usually for some reason the man on the street tracks me down and wants to talk about trading. So Saturday night I was at a wedding and my nephew, who's a good kid, he said, Bitcoin is going down, what should I do? And I said, well, remember last time we got together and I explained to you that markets go up and markets go down? He's like, yes, sir. He's very well mannered, even though it makes me feel old. I don't want to undo what's been done. But anyway, he kind of got the concept. So the fact that he told me Bitcoin is going down means that he has the ability to see what is and what is, is. But then he began to reason with me because what he's seeing in his mind is the market being oversold or in his case he's not familiar with terms like oversold but he's thinking that it's low and maybe it's due to bounce and it has bounced a little bit since Saturday and unfortunately as I'm going to beat the dead horse on in a few minutes the market can be a bad teacher so he might have gotten a really bad lesson from that but the point is no matter how many times I say markets go up and markets go down when someone's in a market and it starts going down, they reason why they should not get out. So I'm a firm believer that your attitude is way more important than your aptitude. I think William Eckert said it the best. I haven't seen much correlation between good trading and intelligence. Some outstanding traders are quite intelligent, but few aren't. Many outstanding intelligent people are horrible traders. Average intelligence is enough. Beyond that, emotional makeup is more important. Well, that makes me feel pretty good because I'm known in the industry as the trend following moron. And I was very hurt when someone called me that because he was someone I had deep respect for and he was being really nasty when he said it. But the reason he said it was because he was fighting trends. I was drawing big blue arrows on the market and it was going up and he kept shorting and shorting and shorting, confusing the issue with facts. Now before I digress too far, a few years back somebody emailed me and they said that they used to have the bad habit of treating their stocks like children. Now for those of you with children, anything short of mass murder you pretty much give them a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, and so on and so forth. And he went on to say that he didn't become successful until he started treating his stocks as employees and not children. Now, I've done complete presentations on this, so let me just give you the Reader's Digest. But before we do that, I was in the gym a while back. Don't laugh. Before COVID, I was actually working out, believe it or not, and seeing some positive results and there was a young kid in there kind of a, a mule works out like crazy and they figured out that or found out that I'm into stocks so to speak and he was telling me that he did really well in pot stocks in fact he made 30 or 40 percent and was pretty excited about it but now he was down about 80 percent in his pot stocks and I said okay Let's say you run a company and you have four employees. Three are busting their buttocks and one is sitting on his. And before I could finish, he interjects and said, I'd fire his ours. And I'm like, exactly. You have to treat your stocks like employees and not like your children. 
So who's getting fired? The one sitting on his buttocks. So you may be wondering why does the non-trader hold and hope? And there's an entire science behind this, and I'm just going to scratch the surface today. But a big part of it is the anchoring effect. So my nephew bought Bitcoin at $60,000, and now he has Bitcoin in his portfolio at $30,000. So he's thinking, well, it was 60, so it could go back to 60. He has that price anchored in his mind. And people who sell you stuff, they know all about anchoring. If you go to buy a car, they're gonna give you some high price, and it's probably gonna shock you a little bit, and then they'll give you a slightly absurd price, but it's lower than that original price. And all of a sudden, because of anchoring, you feel like you're getting a deal. The other thing that happens, quoting the little seagulls from Finding Nemo, is mine, once you own something, it becomes more dear to you than before. And this is known as the endowment effect. And I'll give you an example, a personal example. We downsized probably about a year and a half ago, probably two years by the time we built the house and moved and everything. And I had a lot of stuff to get rid of, and it was hard getting rid of a lot of that stuff, especially at a bargain, because it was near and dear to me. I've collected things throughout my entire life, on and off, coins, stamps, you name it, currencies. And when it comes time to let go of these things, I think they're worth a lot more than they are. But they're only worth what somebody else will pay me. Remember last week we talked about the Great of Fool theory. Now, I did a quick Google to see if I could find a good example of endowment effect. And the first thing came up was the chocolate bar and the coffee cup experiment. They gave a group of people a chocolate bar. Everybody got a chocolate bar. And then they offered a coffee cup. You can keep your chocolate bar, or you can trade your chocolate bar for a coffee cup. Well, not a whole lot of people traded their chocolate bar for the coffee cup. Now, in another room, they gave everyone a coffee cup, and then they offered everybody a chocolate bar in exchange for their coffee cup. Well, what happened? Percentage-wise, the same amount of people gave up their coffee cup as they did their chocolate bar. So there is a, an endowment effect, so to speak. Once you own something, it becomes nearer and dearer to you, especially if you have anchoring. Now, on top of that, there's loss aversion. And this is one of those things from a neurological standpoint that you have to wrap your head around. And this is what creates gamblers ruin. The emotional response for a loss is twice, and I have one client that seems to think it's 10 times, at least in this particular case, but it's at least twice as the emotional response of a game. So losing $100 is a lot more painful emotionally wise than the emotions of making $100. And we don't like to admit that we're wrong. And as soon as you exit a position, that was unprofitable where you should have gotten out when your stop is hit, you have admitted that you're wrong. And I used to always think, why don't people use stops? Why don't people use stops? And one day it hit me like a ton of bricks. Nobody wants to admit that they are wrong. And a good trader on every trade knows there's a potential for a loss. And that was sort of the Churchill analogy last week of a good trader goes from one loss to another without any loss of enthusiasm. Now that doesn't mean throw caution to the win. That means taking trades that must be taken. And we'll get into that in just one second. Now I'm kind of scratching the surface on behavioral finance here. And my only beef with behavioral finance is that all the books start to sound the same. And after you read a few of them, it's like they're all referencing back to thinking fast and slow by Kennerman 
and Tversky, or Tversky had a lot of, to, con to contribute to this book. And those two guys did probably the most groundbreaking research, and everybody and their brother sort of copies off of them. Now, Michael Lewis wrote a book called The Undoing Project, which was actually about those two guys, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman. And it's a really good read, and if you know Michael Lewis, he's written some pretty good books. And I would recommend you read that. And The Undoing Project sort of dovetails in to resulting, which we're going to talk about in a little detail here in just a few minutes. But undoing is basically saying, okay, let's say you take a new route to work and you get in a wreck. Well, the undoing would think that had you not taken that route, you wouldn't have gotten in that wreck. And it's not quite that simple. And I'll give you a, a, an example from last weekend. One of my wife's friends, when my wife was catching up with her on the porch last night, the friend said that she got what she thought was food poisoning from McDonald's. They went to a gas station. They were out of gas. The gas station had a subway. They, they were going to eat subway. And then they said, well, let's just go to this other gas station across the street or down the block that has a McDonald's and also has gas. And she got what she thought was food poisoning. Now, on the surface, you're thinking, had she just eaten subway, she would have been okay. Well, maybe or maybe not. I think she also recently got a gallbladder taken out. And it's my understanding, once your gallbladder is taken out, it's kind of hard to eat greasy stuff. So it's the undoing is not as simple as you might think. And, and my wife is guilty of that all, all the time. It's like, oh, I almost died on the way home today. What happened? An 18-wheeler flipped over. It's like, well, did, it, did you swerve out the way? What happened? Like, oh, no, it was already flipped over. But I was going to leave the office, and then somebody called me back for a second. And had they not called me back for a second, I might have been in that wreck, or I would have been in that wreck. And it's like, well, possibly, but it's really not that simple. And that's something that you kind of have to wrap your head around. And again, that dovetails in with resulting. We'll talk about that in one second. I'd recommend you would read some books. You know, go out and read some books on behavioral finance. Certainly read Thinking Fast and Slow. But also read some books that are kind of on the fringe, such as Seeing What Others Don't. Even though it's not a book on behavioral finance, behavioral science, whatever, it, it's going to help you to read a few of these books that are a little bit more on the fringe. And I remember when I first read this book, Seeing What Others Don't by Gary Klein, I posted or I was giving a webinar and I said, you know, this thing kind of reads like a Malcolm Gladwell book. And I really liked it. And he's one of my favorite authors. And then I looked at the cover and it said, no one has taught me more about complexities and mysteries of human decision making than Gary Klein, Malcolm Gladwell. So on the front cover of his book, he's got a testimonial from Malcolm Gladwell. And a lot of our success or not success all boils down to decisions and more importantly, living with those decisions. And not thinking about undoing or resulting. I'd also recommend you read anything by Dan Arley. He's pretty good. And he's got a couple of books. I've got one here called Dollars and Cents. He has another one. I can't think of the name of it. Where he talks about his experience being blown up by a flash grenade. And, and some of those things that kind of relate to the psychology and all. And it's without giving all the story away. It was pretty good. Pretty interesting to kind of get to know him a little bit. But I would recommend you read anything by Dan Arley. Now, here's a biggie. A trader accepts the fact that trading is unnatural from a psychological and a physiological standpoint. These gurus on the internet claim that trading is so easy. They're F-O-S. I would never be shot on Friday, but the rented jet crowd, and without saying any names, they're being sued for $137 million because they made a lot of false claims about how easy trading is. And again, I never be shot on Friday, but I'm glad that these people are being shut down. And I'd make a lot more money if I told you how easy it was and that there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with all of us. I had somebody emailed me a while back and said, you know, Dave, it never hit me until 
you said you go through all this behavioral science and psychology and research and neurology and you come to the conclusion that we're all crazy. And I think we are a little crazy and I think it does attract some of the crazy people. So if you're feeling kind of crazy, it's probably normal. But it really is unnatural from a psychological and from a physiological standpoint. A lot of trading goes against human nature. I asked a lot of questions a while back. I kept asking over and over, for instance, why do people who seem to be successful, why are they so unsuccessful in trading? And a psychiatrist actually emailed me and said, Dave, I got the answer. At least I think I do. A psychiatrist or an automatic transmission mechanic or a doctor or lawyer has to take whatever train wreck comes along and deal with it. They just simply cannot wait for the perfect pitch. They can't wait and wait and wait and wait. In trading, though, a lot of times it's very unnatural, but you have to wait and wait and wait and wait. Now, here's the good thing. And believe me, it might take 20 years, you know, because I'm constantly learning stuff like, oh, yeah, well, that makes sense. The wise become wise over a period of time. And until you become wise, so to speak, you have to do the hard thing in the meantime. And my biggest example there that I've given 10,000 times is probably 10, 11 years ago, I was speaking in San Francisco and Denise Shaw and some of her research comes from Damasio. But anyway, she was talking about how Every decision has emotions. And I'm like, why am I so emotional? They always say, eliminate your emotions. Eliminate your emotions from trading. Well, guess what? You can't eliminate your emotions. And all of a sudden, that was freeing for me. I'm like, okay, well, I am emotional. I'm dropping F-bombs. What's wrong with me? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And the more traders you get to know, the more normal you are going to feel. Now, a trader thinks in terms of the process. And if you can follow the process, the profits are a byproduct. Now, following the process is key. A bad plan that is well executed will yield much better results than a good plan that is poorly executed. One thing that we'll probably get into in upcoming shows is something I've talked about before is, is somebody emailed me and said, you know, after I got into this trade, it really didn't look as good as I first thought it did. Well, there's always a reason to exit a trade, as I preach, and rarely a reason to stay once you get in. So just continue to follow your plan, and next time, make a better plan going in. It's almost like you have to feel the pain of that bad trade before you're ever going to get better. Now, if you've been around for a while, you'll notice that I quote... Ed Sakota quite often, and in the first Market Wizards, he talked about the intuition versus intuition type of trade. And if you could figure out the difference between those two vis-a-vis -vis trading, write me a letter. Now, taking one step further, I call it the must-take trade and the mistake trade. Now, the must-take trade could obviously have two outcomes, positive or negative. Now, the must-take trade, if it has a positive outcome, you're going to obviously have some good feelings. And you still need to do the post-mortem to make sure that it truly was a great trade to begin with. And then you have to check your ego to avoid making sure that it wasn't a mistake trade. Now, you then say next, and you move on to the next one. Now, obviously... Sometimes a good trade can end badly. So you have a negative outcome. You have a little frustration. I've already dropped a few F-bombs this morning, truth be told. And you do a post-mortem and you realize that, you know what? And this is where the true enlightenment comes. When you find yourself doing this, you've made it. If you can honestly say, if I saw that trade tomorrow, that same exact trade, I would take it, even though it ended badly, even though the resulting makes you think you shouldn't have taken that trade. Of course, you shout next, and you move on. Now, one thing I didn't mention is the postmortem is fantastic, but even better than the postmortem, which might help you to avoid a mistake trade, 
is to do a pre-mortem. Is this really a great trade? Do a little time travel and think of yourself looking back to this trade, as I've said before, and think about how your future self is going to feel about this trade. Now, the mistake trade is along the lines of the Sakota into wishing trade. You're trying to make something happen that really isn't there. And you're not really thinking about how you're going to feel in the future. Now, here's where the danger comes in. If you have a positive outcome, you're obviously going to have good feelings from that. But when you do your post-mortem, one or two things is going to happen. One, you say, you know what? Thank the market gods. That was a stupid trade. I should not have done that. But it worked, didn't it? I said that once to someone in a hedge fund based on a trade that I recommended. And he said, you know, you just picked up nickels in front of a bulldozer. Congratulations. He was right. Now, if you feel like I'm a market god, but it worked, didn't it? Then you have created a negative feedback loop for yourself. Now, if you have a negative outcome, you're obviously going to be frustrated. And in your postmortem, if you're thinking stupid, my wife had a years ago before she had her own company, she had a boss and the boss would come in every Monday morning and tell stories about what her teenage sons did over the weekend. And then after she was through telling the story, she'd go stupid. <laughs> but if you feel like you're stupid or as Annie Duke says, just desserts, OK, you got what you deserved then you are going to learn from that and then you're going to get back over to the top with the must take trade now if you think you were just unlucky then again you're going to end up in that negative feedback loop now i'm just kind of scratching the surface here but as you can see the process of going through this this emotional cycle so to speak is very important so the market can be a really bad teacher, as I've said, ad nauseum. And a trader has to constantly guard against resulting. You can take that mistake trade and have it work out beautifully. But if you didn't recognize that you should have taken the trade in the first place, you've learned absolutely nothing. So again, as I've said 10,000 times, now 10,001, the market can be a really bad teacher. Now, getting back to the resulting word I've been using so much, resulting makes you think that you know something about whether a decision was good or bad because you know if the outcome is good or bad. Wrapping your head around that is key. If you don't take anything away from this presentation with that, I think you're going to be well on your way. Andy Duke wrote Thinking in Bets. I would strongly urge you to read that book. And also, I have her new book here. I'm not a big fan of workbooks. It's a bit of a workbook, but it's pretty good. And this is where I got the quote from. It's called How to Decide. And if you want to listen to these books, go to davelearner.com slash books to read. We're just beginning to scratch the surface on how to think like a trader. But I truly believe that if you could just learn to have the proper attitude and think like a trader. I know we're just scratching the sur surface on it, but we're going to get there. I promise you. I think you're going to be well on your way to becoming successful.